Okay, we are in section six, which is probably the most important message that you get today, but <clears throat> nobody really is that interested in learning more about this part um, on the day that they're taking a notary signing agent course, but we believe this with all um, our heart. Uh, you're a notary public first. You need to know your laws. And there's a few things that you should, before you start being a signing agent or before you go out and become a signing agent, there's some things that you need to check off your list first. First, you need to take your notary oath of office if required by your state. And it is required in Texas um, and <clears throat> other states. That means you need to go before a notary, another notary. And like Jake said at the beginning of this, he will um, do uh, Ron, he will notarize by Ron if you, and I, I will too, um, if you need, if y'all want to get, if you need somebody to notarize your oath of office, then we can do it through Ron. Uh, knowing acceptable forms of identification is important. Every state has a little bit different spin on it. You need to know how to complete journal entries, <clears throat> especially the ones that pertain to real estate transactions, how to complete a certificate flawlessly, both giraffes and certificates of acknowledgement. And I've been seeing <clears throat> in my work, several verification certificates, which is kind of a, it, it's a little, it's just sort of a cross between um, a giraffe and almost like an acknowledgement, but just need to know how to fill those out without making mistakes. Be familiar with all components of a notarial certificate. The venue, state of Texas, county of Brazos, that's me. Um, the uh, name of the, the signer, your name, if it has to be listed properly. Uh, I mean, in, in the body of the certificate and some don't, I believe it or not, they just sign and put it below the certificate, and some do. Um, in Texas, one of ours does have does have the uh, notary signature. In uh, let's see, so there, and then the language, and um, the the uh, the notary signature, what goes there, the seal, and if necessary, put in the com my commission expires. Um, since they've added um, our number and and commission expiration date, I don't put um, the the commission. I mean, my commission expires unless they ask for it, and then I certainly do comply because I think it just looks tacky if you don't go ahead and fill out something that's underneath your signature. So when to modify certificates, that that is like. You need to know what your language is. And the way you find that out is to go to whatever office that commissions you and ask them to give you that information. Um, so you would modify, say you got a, um, a California certificate and you're located in um, Maryland. Well, there's probably a big difference in the way those certificates look because everybody's a little bit different than California. So you would need to know, can I use this certificate? Is there a problem with it or not? And some, like California is a real stickler on their certificates, but like Texas, as long as the certificate represents basically what our language would say, then we're good. We, we can just maybe, um, you know, go ahead with that certificate as long as it, it doesn't go wild on something else. I think Georgia's certificates, Louisiana's certificates, maybe Virginia's certificates would be a little bit different than a Texas certificate. But when you get one of those from another a lender who's located in a different state, then you're going to need to know if you can modify it or if you just need to attach your own, own, own certificate. And we call those loose certificates. You need to know how to handle missing signers. For instance, if you have three sisters who are selling a piece of property and they all live in three different states, you need to know that you're going to strike whoever's not in front of you. You're going to strike that out of the signature, uh, out of the certificate that you complete. And only focus on the person who's before you. And then the notaries that are, seeing the other two sisters will have to 
put their information into a certificate. These are the kind of things that are really important and some of the things that really are, they cause mistakes when notaries are new or just getting into this business. <clears throat> so the unfortunate truth about being a notary signing agent rather than just a plain notary, and nobody talks about this, is that we all want our money when we go and do something, but some companies are not going to pay you the full fee if you want, if, if you or your signers won't allow something to be notarized because you feel that something's amiss. Maybe you don't feel like you've got adequate uh, identification of the signer or maybe the signer says, okay, uh, this is not what we agreed to. Well, you've already driven 35 miles and, you know, you've printed documents. Now, aren't they going to pay you? Because you did all your work. So what's up there? I mean, aren't they going to pay you? Well, actually, the unfortunate truth is no, they are probably not going to pay you full fee. Some every now and then, because of extenuating circumstances, you might get paid the full fee. But here's the thing. If you can't say no when something is wrong in a transaction, then rethink this career. It, notaries never really were set up. That they're supposed to be always just no interest in the transaction whatsoever. Um, they witness signatures and collected maybe a paltry 25 cents or just a very small amount. And some states are still like that. Um, Texas, we can collect $6 for a signature or a certificate. But in, in the signing agent world, we're going to collect, you know, uh, substantially more. So if you are not going to, you know, stand up for what's right on something, and instead want the um, the money more than you want to do the right thing, then rethink this career because it'll eventually get you in trouble. I do know one notary who actually went to the pen back in the penitent prison. I guess I shouldn't talk like I'm from Texas. Went to the pen, but uh, he actually went into the prison system. He was in Oklahoma because uh, at that time and when things were going crazy and mortgage lending and it just went nuts and the housing bubble burst when he went, but he just was not above taking a little extra money to do something. And so he actually did notary bad things and appraisals bad. He just got out not long ago. <clears throat> so if you can't walk away from $150, go ahead and, 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 and notarize if you so you go ahead and notarize a document that you shouldn't then you are conflicted so a conflict of interest is not okay as a notary so okay we can use notarize for family members in certain states other states no you can't it's just, just your state law laws but in texas there's nothing against notarizing for your family however i would recommend not to do it just because um, even though you're not benefiting financially, you are interested in the outcome for your family member. Uh, some you, you always have feelings one way or another about people that you know well, like your family. So either you don't want them to get something or you do want them to get something and your notarization may facilitate that. Um, so just don't put yourself in that situation and, and it won't be a problem. Okay. Um, the other thing that is really important not to do is not to discriminate. Uh, federally protected classes of people are as the following list states. Okay, you may not feel like you would ever discriminate ag against anyone about notarizing documents, but I realized I was getting close to it in, in a job that I had before because I was asked to notarize documents that weren't part of my job. And so I was getting frustrated because people were just sending strangers to me. If, you know, I was in this building at Texas a and and if somebody needed something notarized, well, everybody in the building knew, okay, she's a notary. And so I would 
like just be so frustrated. So I said, um, well, I could notarize just the professors, but not the people who are just, you know, coming in off the street or whatever. Well, fortunately, before I started implementing that, I talked to my employer. They backed me up on that. And that I should, you know, there was no need for me to notarize for anybody who didn't work for the, for Texas A&M. So by having that, they were fine with it. You don't want to like, just um, like reject anybody for any reason, because they're a group or not part of a group. And you, if you set a policy that you can't notarize for somebody during your work hours at your employer or, or whatever, then stick to that policy. And um, I, you know, I give veterans um, a, uh, a break on my prices across the board. In fact, if they will let me, I notarize one document for free. Um, the same with um, elderly people over 70. But <clears throat> you just need to remain co consistent. It's not, it's not bad to give a discount to senior citizens or veterans as long as you're not saying, well, you know, those people go to so-and-so church, so I am not going to give them a discount. You just can't do it that way, but y'all probably, y'all already knew that. So the main thing to remember about this particular chapter is to know your notary laws and to really think about what you're doing. Think of it as an honorable office in your state and in your community, it's not just a way to make money. You really do hold a, an important role, have an important role in society as a notary. And that is it for number, for um, number six.